Now we're going to continue this conversation on the challenges. Um, but before we delve into the next panel, I'd love to, first of all, remind us of um, the points that Dan made when he jumped up and down here. Make sure that you download the ebook. We did put a lot of resources into getting this book um, open access, so we would really appreciate if you downloaded this and if you left positive reviews. Secondly, we do have a number of people that have worked really hard on this event, and usually these people don't get acknowledged or noticed, but at Scrap Reverends we do things quite differently. So we do have um, Sarah Kapasi from Scrap Reverence, who has worked very hard to put this event together. We also have others who are not here, but have worked behind the scenes. So we have Eloisa Romani, we have Cressida, we have Mario, and a lot of, a lot of the people working at Frontline. So please give them a round of applause to appreciate it. <laughs> now, we're going to transition to the second round, and we're going to look at the challenges of OSINT investigation. And on the panel, allow me to, int to introduce Idris Ahmad, who is a senior lecturer in journalism at the University of Essex. Next to him, we have Ben Strick coming back again, who is the director of investigations at the Center for Information Resilience and Myanmar Witness. And we worked together on the Ocelli project for a brief stint in 2020. And finally, we have Lydia Wilson, who is an editor and writer at New Lines Magazine and an independent research writer. And our moderator, once again, is Henrietta Wilson. So over to you, Henrietta. Thank you very much, Ola. Yes, so before the break, we were looking a bit at what open source investigations are, how they're done, what the point of them is, and now we're looking at some of the challenges. Because not all open source investigations are good. They can be poorly conducted, they can be misapplied, they can be misunderstood. So I think it's very important that we all get a sense of these things. Um, so I'm going to start with you, Idris. I was wondering, please, could you give us an example of open source investigations that have not been well done and what the difference between good and bad investigations are in the context of your work on journalism? Thank you. Can I give you two? Yes. <laughs> OK. Um, so many years back, uh, before OSINT really exploded on the, on the scene, um, I was doing some research on, on these drone strikes that were happening in Pakistan. And uh, at that time, the fatalities were being calculated by a few tracking agencies. And um, um, one of the assumptions that it started with was because the US government would, would make a claim that every, every time they would have a drone strike that this many terrorists killed here, this many terrorists killed there. And these were being tabulated. That's a great successful um, uh, counterterrorism program and drones were being prom promoted at that time as this, this kind of panacea for this terrorism problem. Except the thing was that if you lived somewhere near the region, um, I grew up in the, in the region, so um, what you would find is that, well, a large part of the story was remained untold, which was, this was a place which is, again, un it was unavailable to OSINT. That's one of the reasons why sometimes um, the assumption that everything can be digital investigation uh, needs to be questioned because there are many place, places which are digitally inaccessible. That is one example. And so a lot of the deaths that were occurring in those, those places, nobody knew who was being killed because the CIA was using a particular um, um, policy that was called, they called them signature strikes. It was based on pattern of life intelligence. The determination of who is or not a con considered a terrorist was based very often on this description was MIM, the military aged, sorry, MAM, the military aged male. And uh, that could be anybody from, you know, a teenager to uh, a ma an elderly man. And uh, sometimes the patterns of life with the which they were speaking about could be something like if is a man urinating, standing up or sitting down. If he's sitting down, well, he's an Islamic extremist. So kill him. So that, that, those were the kinds of things that were being um, uh, made. And some agencies started ch pushing back. The best work was done by the Bureau of Investigative Journalism, and uh, you know, Chris Wood at the time did this great research, and he then later on uh, went on to find, uh, found air wars. And, but the thing was, a lot of the, the statistics that you were getting in very precise terms in the newspapers and in the media were based entirely on claims, 
both the claims that were being made by the CIA and also uh, made by the Pakistani officials who had their own reason not to reveal the extent of the civilian deaths. But that place was inaccessible. Most of the time, even the CIA didn't know who they were killing. So that's why the numbers which were being collected by agencies like the New America Foundation, that was the Long War Journal and all, so they were entirely based on these claims which were very hard to refute because nobody was even going there. In the, the, re the region itself was inaccessible, but, but, so nobody was actually going there to even find out that who was or who wasn't being killed. The second example I want to quickly touch on is re a recent one, which was uh, soon after the Gaza war started, there was an incident, a hospital was bombed. Um, and um, in this case, what happened is that um, uh, immediately, within a few hours, this counter-narrative then emerged that, well, there was this um, rocket that which when it went up and in the Al Jazeera footage, you see the ro rocket exploding in the air and um, the, uh, the counter narrative was that, well, this was the rocket that exploded and caused the explosion on the ground. And at the same time, there was a barrage of um, 17 rockets that was being fired, which was available, which could be seen in other footage. And um, so all of these and also the third physical fact which was suggested in the open source investigation was that that there was uh, the crater on the ground wasn't large enough for a bomb. So from all of this, the conclusion was that this was a Hamas rocket or you know, the Palestinians themselves were somehow the cause of this. The problem with that was that uh, you know, I don't know any more than anybody else that what specifically happened that day. But the problem was with all of the physical facts that added up to the, this counter thesis were eventually they were all um, undermined by first by the New York Times. Again, because the, the problem that has happened uh, uh, is that right now there is this tendency with a lot of this competition has almost emerged. A lot of people describe themselves as open source researchers, but they don't wait to investigate enough. What they do is that they want to be the first outside the gate. They want to be the first one out with a narrative. And those narratives later on, if they get undermined, doesn't matter. By that time, the narrative has taken hold. So the US government and the Israeli government still hold on to that thesis that that rocket, which was seen in an Al Jazeera video, caused that explosion on the ground, even though that rocket then turned out the uh, others had done it even before that, but the New York Times were confirmed, uh, you know, Eric Toller, who's one of the contributors to this book, was uh, part of that investigation, which showed that while well, that rocket was actually that exploded several miles away from, and it was an intercept of the, uh, by the uh, Israeli Iron Dome system. So what happened in that case was eventually the physical evidence fell apart, but the thesis remained because by that time it had taken hold. And the thesis sustained itself on, so there, there was a kind of a probability versus possibility. Probability was the balance of evidence of what was happening at this time. There were airstrikes happening at this time, and hospitals had been targeted at this time. And then the possibility that can a rocket misfire and fire, you know, hit, this, uh, hit a hospital, and, but because there was kind of also the power bias, so the, eventually the narrative that took hold was the one that was based on the possibility rather than the probability based on the balance of evidence. Great, thank you very much. Um, and it reminds me, your answer really reminds me of a couple of key principles that I think shine out through the book. It's not always easy or quick or even possible to find the truth about an event around, uh, across the world. Um, and this actually isn't a new problem, right? Intelligence scholars talk about context collapse where people take data and, and uh, out of its context and read all sorts of things into it that, that really aren't there. I think your answer is really interesting too in giving us some pointers about how open source practitioners do, uh, how good open source practitioners kind of uh, um, can, can manage these problems, which is strict methodologies, which you kind of implied in the first half, this sort of following a process, you collect the data, you don't believe it, you check it and then rather than thinking that a single piece of data will give you a correspondence truth to, to truth, you're building up patterns of understanding and being transparent about what you're doing so that you can be checked against your peers. Yeah, thank you very, very much, Idris, for getting us going. I'm going to hand over now to Lydia, if that's okay. Um, so um, I'm very interested in your work, which gives a different slant on open source research um, and deals with big amounts of data. Um, and I'm wondering how you cope 
in, in, the, in the way that you approach open source research with the vast and growing amounts of data we now have and how you distinguish between myths and disinformation in your work. Yeah, a lot of questions. Thank yes. you. <laughs> Um, so a bit of background, my chapter is co-written with uh, colleagues, we were all at that time at the Cybercrime Centre at the University of Cambridge's Computer Lab, and it was about the efforts to build a database um, on online extremism materials, so constant scraping of um, communities, online communities. They started with the far right, when I joined we extended it to jihadi Islamism as well. Um, so it's the opposite problem, really, of combing through looking for information to <laughs> understand a single event. There's, <laughs> as we all know, there's far too much extremist material online. And so the problems are to do with scale. Um, and also, when you're building a database for posterity, uh, there's a lot of selection involved. Uh, so for that, what's always important is very uh, subject-specific uh, expertise. We, you need very detailed qualitative workers before you start with the huge quantitative approaches of um, the big data can, can offer. Uh, to select communities that are worthy of study um, and also to follow communities because certainly on the jihadi side uh, a lot of the tech companies have taken it very seriously in trying to shut it down much less so on the far right um, um, but there are people who are following them closely enough that when one community gets closed down or one platform gets closed down uh, they can follow them and so you need people like that who are working in real time we can't just leave it to computer scrapers as, as great as they are at doing what they do uh, you need human intervention every single day. Um, so there's so the scale is 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 a challenge in terms of finding the right communities amongst all the noise. And then of course the scale is really challenging in any sort of analysis. Um, I I can't even remember what was it 60 million when we wrote it posts, but it's grown obviously since we wrote the chapter because we're scraping every day. Um, and so what do you do with hundreds of millions of posts of extremist content? Um, so this is again where we need very much lots and lots of different types of input from different types of researchers. Mixed methods are absolutely key. You need, so obviously you can't read that many posts, so big data approaches are really so helpful. Um, but they're not very good at extremist content. Um, we haven't had many data sets for anything to be trained on. Um, so what we started with was this um, topic modeling, kind of like a really fancy word cloud, um, but powered through all 60 million posts. Um, and we let the computer find topics. And then you sample. And you sample and sample and sample and to find, to, to, to retrain the model. So, on, so there were some topics where um, they were finding kind of fake topics um, because a lot of forums that aren't very well looked after keep their metadata inside the post. So we got one that had font size and stuff because that was coming up in every single post. So of course the computer thought that was a topic. So you got those kind of wrongly labeled topics, but then they missed topics. And a terrible example of that was that anti-Semitism wasn't coming up at all. And m me and the other qualitative researcher, we'd spent enough time on far-right forums to know that anti-Semitism was actually kind of fundamental to a lot of their conspiracies and a lot of their word, world outlets, outlooks. And so um, we kind of tried to figure out why. And it was because the language used for anti-Semitism is so varied that the computers weren't picking up on it as one single topic. So then there's a lot of training there that that's involved, but just there's a lot of expertise that's needed from lots of different areas. And sorry, that was too long, I know. No, um, it was really <laughs> fascinating and a, an, an amazing reality check that kind of echoes what Dan was saying uh, um, before the break about although AI and machine learning options are amazing and can be one way of, of helping make sense of the enormous amounts of data there are, you can't get rid of the human. If you get rid of the human, you really risk completely misunderstanding what you've got. Misunderstanding in terms of what needles you're looking for, but also 
which haystacks there are. Yeah, thank you. So, Ben, I'm now going to ask you um, a question. Um, I want to say um, I like all the chapter authors equally. It's great to have Ben back again. And why I asked him to come back was for symmetry between the two groups and also because in this particular configuration, you're overlapping with a lot of the different themes. So thank you very much for being the, the, <laughs> the devil person. Yeah, thank you. So what I want to think about is since you first got involved in, in this sort of area, um, there have been enormous changes, right? The stuff that you did in the Cameroon, the investigations on the Cameroonian murders might not be possible now because Facebook has changed. Many platforms are changing their terms of conditions. There are laws that have changed the resolution of satellite imagery we can see. The internet has changed. It's kind of fractured. You get a different internet in different places. So can open source research, can your work survive in this changing digital landscape? Thank you. I beg to differ. Um, actually, I think, uh, I, I think it's uh, probably got a very broad horizon uh, and, and a very, uh, you know, a data saturated environment as well. Um, I think that would be the biggest struggle with open source is just too much data. Um, if, we, if we think about the, uh, you know, the digital penetration into, into sub-Saharan Africa where more mobile phone sales are absolutely exponential through the roof every single year. Um, internet connectivity is going through. Um, you know, once upon a time in when I was first working on Sudan uh, in 2017, um, it was hard to get videos from Darfur. Like, just wasn't that common. Um, now we've got Starlink, uh, which you know, I you know, I'm not going to comment about any of that publicly as to who runs Starlink or how good it is. Uh, but it's been useful for if I was a soldier from the RSF, which is the bad group, um, or the SAF, which has done really bad things as well, um, I can basically pop a Starlink on the roof of my technical or my Jeep. I can sit out, I can make my tea and sit out and, and have a, a, a Meerschaum pipe and, uh, and sit in the kind of dunes of, of Darfur and happily scroll away on TikTok, uploading all of my war footage. And this is why you're seeing so much accurate footage on the BBC every night of the fight in Darfur's last city, El Fasha, that's not under RSF control. We get minute by minute videos because the RSF and SAF are able to upload realms of data every single day. That's something that we didn't have five, six, seven years ago. It just wasn't possible. And now we're almost live streaming massacres in sub-Saharan or, or, or East Africa. Um, so open source is very much needed. I think there's more needed. Since we, we wrote the chapter, I think all of us wrote the chapter about three years ago. I, I wrote mine in 2021. Um, God forbid, that was a lot of, of, of badness ago. That was a lot of horror ago. Uh, a lot of sleepless nights, a lot of tears, a lot of, you know, I couldn't, I couldn't save them, I couldn't help that for a lot of our people. Um, and and I, I think if I, if I take myself back then to where we are today, the industry has expanded. Um, the UK government, for example, is trying to bring in open source intelligence ethics because they've got so many open source providers that are just chucking data in. They're throwing out grants left, right and centre. The US government how, now has it with their US um, uh, National Intelligence Directorate. They're banging on about open source. There's more funding going towards open source. So it has increased exponentially since the writing of this book. Um, thankfully, all the techniques are still valid that I write about. Um, so yeah, I, I, I think it's I think it's really big, and that's where we're on the cusp of this as well, because it's a necessary evil that now we're at the biggest year of elections. More than half the world is going to vote this year. Some have already voted, um, but. There's a lot of elections still coming up. And I think of some main ones, especially in the Western world. I mean, we've got America, we've got the US, we've got France, we've got the EU. Um, you know, we've, we've had India as well. I mean, God. And those things right there, if we can chuck that kind of open source mentality and those techniques into places like India, with the BJP running its disinformation operations in Bengal, in West Bengal, the, one of the biggest electorates in India, to counter that disinformation where Modi is preaching, you know, I, I'm, I won't go on about that. Um, but, you know, all of these sorts of things. So I think it is bigger, it is probably better because there are more good people doing it, it is worse because there are more bad people doing it, and it is even worse because there is more information out there and a much bigger environment to throw poison into, and that poison I refer to as propaganda and disinformation. 
Well, that's reassuring and depressing, I'd say. <laughs> it's reassuring to know that practitioners are keeping up with this changing landscape. You know, the, the changing, the, the ways in which Twitter algorithms work does feel like it's changed, but maybe it relates to the question we had earlier about that practitioners can stay innovative even while they work within a framework. And I think I'm really interested by our, your answer in kind of pointing to this OSINT instinct that maybe what really underlines good investigations is starting with curiosity and wanting to find out. And the basic of uh, scientific methods, academic methods, research, call it what you will, of getting data and checking it before you believe it, verifying it, uh, checking the provenance is something that underlines all good investigations. Yeah, thank you. Um, and maybe transporting that, translating that into different places will be very helpful over time. Yeah, thank you. So I'm now going to have some questions about overcoming uh, the challenges. Um, and Idris, it kind of relates to some of the conversations we had earlier about the Berkeley Protocol, um, uh, etc. I'm wondering, I'm, I'm interested in your work. So you analyse investigative journalism. You are an investigative journalist. You were one of the early adopters of Bellingcat open source research training. So I'm wondering how you see the, the, the sector developing in the way that Ben's just reflected on and what needs to happen to make sure that it's a healthy, growing, safe and vibrant field. Thank you. Um, so I, I'm the director of journalism at the University of Essex and one of the things that um, um, I have done is made open source investigations part of the training for investigative journalism generally, or journalism research generally. Uh, because, you know, it's not an option anymore that um, there are, especially if you're reporting on conflicts, there are many conflicts which are inaccessible. So there's the only way you can um, report on them is that you use these uh, new methods that are available, very often you're improvising. And uh, then again, there are great resources created by, for example, people like Ben has one of the best YouTube channels where he has produced some outstanding series of lessons on um, the different open source techniques. So it's kind of a just expanding the repertoire of uh, the technical kind of uh, expertise that students have at this moment, and also expanding, broadening it out to places where, um, so right now, uh, every summer, well, this um, summer we are training journalists from India. Uh, so we have 10 human rights fellows who are um, um, guardian ourselves, our human rights center, and um, my journalism department. So we are training them. And again, open source journalism is part of it. But the other part of it, which is something that uh, Lydia was touching on, is the human element. And because one of the things that happens is um, a lot of the time um, when we are talking about stories, um, as I mentioned earlier on, uh, that story about Pakistan was brought home to me because there was one individual um, who was reported killed 16 different times by the US. And that wasn't just one individual. You know, there are many cases like that. And, you know, 16 different times. Somebody died, but obviously it wasn't this guy. Or the guy had, you know, more lives than any cat that you've known. So, but the thing was that um, um, mm -hmm. those individual stories sometimes are the windows into some larger reality. And uh, one of the things, so one of my, one of my other kind of uh, affiliations was that I, um, uh, I used to, well, I was part of the team with Lydia that who had founded New, New, New Lines magazine. And one of our aims at the time was that sometimes you need that human story to tell, you know, that you want to be able to, um, there's a lot of research on this, uh, especially on the concept of empathy that, you know, if you say that, well, there's a big conflict going on, big atrocities and large numbers, they don't move people. It's usually the one individual story that people can hook on to, that that is what gets you to reflect on the larger story um, that you're speaking about. So that is something that I have made integral to the, um, the training of students. Uh, where I teach, but also to my scholarship that it, become, it has become something that we have to pay attention to now because the problem is again of saturation because just as in the past on the internet you had everybody describing themselves as the geopolitical expert, now everybody has started putting hashtag OSINT into their bios. Most of them are just producing this information rather than challenging it. So that ability to make a distinction between who is actually 
um, producing knowledge and who is polluting the information sphere, that is something that is going to become essential in the future, any kind of uh, you know, media literacy program. Great, thank you. Um, and I think you know, that was so interesting, at remembering it's not just about the collection, it's not just about the analysis, it's not just reaching conclusion. How you present your findings and who you present your findings to makes a difference and needs to be paid attention to. Thank you very much. Um, Lydia, um, I'm interested to think about what key messages you have about ethical best practice in this field. So again, the sense of as it grows, as it gets bigger, as we're finding more people wanting to claim the OSINT banner, how do we make sure mm. that the sector stays safe and ethical? So there are, it is ethically really tricky. I mean, it, legally collecting um, data online is, is fairly straightforward. I don't think people realize that when they say things on some of these chat rooms, that's equivalent to publishing it. I, it, I mean, it's in the terms and conditions, but who reads the terms and conditions of anything? Um, and so we're, we're perfectly legitimate in collecting these incredibly personal stories. You know, people go on these rooms mostly to find, to find some people, to find their tribe. They go and they share their some really very innermost stories about how they've ended up in these chat rooms. Um, and they quite often don't bother anonymizing. Um, or if they do, it's really just, you know, facile. Um, and so, you know, there is, there's a real sense sometimes while you're reading of voyeurism. You know you are just using other people's lives um, for quite clinical research. Um, and, yeah, as I say, legally that's, that's fine. They, 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 haven't, they don't own that data once they've put it into the public domain. Um, but you have to be very careful about protecting all of those people and, you know, plenty of people who leak and, and do mass document dumps do no protection at all of the names inside the content. Um, I mean, we, we have an ethical form at, at Cambridge that anybody using this database has to do that, that kind of anonymization, um, which I think is fairly basic. Uh, but there's far more than that because... Um, it's sometimes, depending on the subject you're doing, it's sometimes fairly easy to trace back. Um, and s but there's also the questions of ethics of protecting the researcher. I don't remember who said it on the earlier panel, um, but there's a lot of secondary trauma attached to a lot of this work. And that's something that certainly the academic sector hasn't really kept on top of at all. There's just been, in this last few years, there's been a few more places acknowledging uh, trauma of secondary trauma for journalists. Um, and there are research establishments and clinical support for journalists who have been in conflict zones. Because there's often a very heavy weight of guilt attached to secondary trauma, that it's I didn't experience it, so why am I having a hard time? You know, it's far worse for the people who actually were under those bombs or, or you know, I had a plane ticket home kind of feel. Um, but it is real, and I think... And I, I, I can't... I don't know about the NGO sector at all, um, or think tanks, but academia do, doesn't seem to really protect its researchers at all. So that's a whole other, an other level of ethics that needs to be thought of quite quickly, I think. Thank you, Lydia. I mean, it's just all so uh, amazingly rich, but kind of very, very deeply conflicting and confusing, uh, thinking some of these things through. And just, just to mention, um, like the Berkeley Protocol, there are global or, or there, are, there are initiatives that are trying to make sense of some of this work. And the one, the one example that I'd, sh I'd mention is the Stanley Centre for Peace and Security that have developed um, a methodology, a set of lenses, um, which encourage people to work, that encourage practitioners to work through these different lenses to really understand the ethics that are facing them in a particular investigation and have a very clear, clear message. There may not be a right answer there are wrong answers you want to avoid, but you want to get as close as possible to the right answer for you for a given situation and understand how you arrived at that right, right answer. Uh, thank you very much. So before we go to audience Q&A, Ben, I, I would like to ask if you've got any more insights into what you think the next steps are for the global community of open source research practitioners, how we can support them, how they can support themselves to grow in a way that's good for the world and, and minimizes the worse and worser options that you outlined. Yeah, thank you. 
Um, oh gosh, this is off the cuff, and I should say something clever. Um, so I think, I mean, one of the main things we've been sort of trying to do, in, in, and especially in our, our trainings around the world, is focus on this idea that open source is a little bit of a kind of grenade. You want to throw it in, in the right area, but also think about, you know, if you've got any friends kind of standing nearby the impact as well. Um, so thinking about, you know, when you publish an investigation, who might be affected, right? And we've kind of spoken about this around the human story, but also thinking around the human beings around outside of it, right? Um, so, you know, I, I think that's an important one because there is a lot of hype around OSINT. Uh, you know, I mean, we have this event. I don't think this is a hyped event. I think this is a good event. Um, and it's awesome that we're all here today, but there is a lot of hype online around open source and OSINT. Um, there's a lot of kind of geo-guesser hype. It's a, it's a game that people play on Google Maps and they go into real life and they, you know, they, they, they locate these things and they go, oh, cool, let's play geo-guesser on Ukraine and let's uh, identify where all these Russian vehicles are. And then before you know it, you have a whole list of Ukrainian people's addresses where they film from their apartment windows uh, showing Russian tanks driving by in occupied areas. So you think about, okay, the impact of that grenade that you've just thrown on Twitter, who might receive that? Who might get that? Who's going to get the door knock at the end of that tweet, right? And I, I think there's a, there's a kind of data hygiene or digital hygiene that we need to think about when we hit publish, as you say. Because for us, when we read it, it's, you know, people are publishing personal stories. But also when you hit publish, I mean, once upon a time when we hit publish on a newspaper, it would get a, a regional circulation or a broad circulation. I, I grew up with newspapers. I started my job with newspapers. It would only hit a certain remit. I could write something in Western Australia and no one in New York would ever read that. But now when I publish it online, someone in Myanmar can read that. Someone in Ukraine can read that. Someone in New York can read that. So thinking about that, that, that repercussion that that information could have um, and, and really setting those... I don't think standards, but I do think best practices and what good open source looks like and what good data hygiene looks like, I think is crucial. Great. Uh, really important point. And what I'm hearing there is some of the responsibility lies with the open source research practitioners. A lot of it. You know, that there's a lot that needs to be thought about and there are some unconscionable things that can be done. If you've identified the location of a young child uh, in a conflict zone, don't let antagonists know about that. Um, on the other hand, I also heard from there, there's responsibility on the whole world. We're all open source research practitioners, right? We all need to be careful about what we're reading, what we're understanding, what we're circulating, what we're believing. Um, so thank you very much. Audience, has anybody got any questions from our panelists? Great, we've got one at the back. Oh, do you want to? Thank you. Um, and carry on putting your hands up so we will try and kind of line up some different questions as we go. Yeah, hi. Um, I was a journalist. Um, uh, um, I read in the stage. Um, I read the stage in the, in the library earlier on, and the, the, I can't hear you very well. Could you I re read in the stage, the yeah. newspaper, you know, the, the, the trade magazine for theatricals, that um, people who write for theatre now are, are earning less than the um, minimum wage, being hor horrifically exploited. You know. Um, and I'm trying to work out how um, people can afford to do this. Where's the funding coming from? That's my question. Great, thank you. Are there any other questions uh, for the time being? No. Okay. Well, I'm going to start with it. Oh, sorry, did I miss? I'm so sorry, Jessica. Yeah, brilliant. Um, uh, Jessica. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Jessica Bumasaro Brady, I'm a senior lecturer in policing and security at Canterbury Christchurch University. Um, and I'm also a former detective in the Met Police. Um, and my question is really around um, what are the methodologies that you guys use in OS, OS um, in investigations that can actually be used for criminal investigations? Um, I used to work in a murder unit um, and we used uh, open source all the time and we did a crap job of it. Um, what can policing organizations learn from open source investigations that you guys use that we can actually um, use in our own investigations? Thanks. Great, thank you very much. Um, so has anybody got a favorite question they want to tackle? Um, where, where is time? So Idris, do you want to get us started? One on the finances of open source research, one on the 
what, what do you call the collision from an investigation? You can take one or both, yeah. Uh, yeah, I'll, uh, so the short answer to that is that, uh, yes, journalism generally is facing a crisis. And uh, it's not just this type of journalism. This is why a lot of the people who were doing OSINT often came from, you know, they were doing other things at the same time. Like, uh, I, I don't think that I would be do, able to do a lot of journalism if I didn't have my day job as an acad academic. So journalism is generally facing a crisis, which is, um, um, you know, especially with the disappearance of local news and all. So that has affected e every type of, type of journalism. So that's why a lot of the people who joined the open source community were, you know, people who had other jobs, who were doing other things. Um, uh, so a lot of the funding recently, um, you know, that's something that Ben would be able to speak to, that uh, there are organizations which have emerged. I mean, even Bellingcat, until very late, it was all volunteer effort. Mm -hmm. I remember meeting, uh, you know, at um, Elliott in 2017 at uh, the Byline Festival, and uh, until then, they didn't have much funding. So it was only, you know, mm -hmm. through the high profile that was achieved through some great successes that the funding was um, eventually um, secured. Um, regarding your question, I mean, I think that there are, you know, a lot of methods that have been used and in law enforcement, especially uh, more recent, there were some cases in which there was, um, you know, people who were child explo exploitation, the images were used to um, uh, locate the, the individuals. But that also brings up a question of why open source often doesn't work when it's adopted by states or agencies. Because one of the strengths of open source is the openness of the community, which provides a kind of, a, a kind of peer review, that you are saying that, well, you're making a claim that, well, this happened over here. Somebody will be out there challenging you if you're getting it wrong. There is a... Um, I mean, there was a, in Boston, after the Boston bombing, there was an example of um, what happens when you don't have that kind of a check, that when it becomes everybody's just rushing to find some kind of a theory, and they ended up kind of misidentifying who the killers were, and you know, there were um, innocent people who, were, who had to, uh, who had to go into hiding because their pictures had been put up, and on internet there were all these claims about, about this. So that is a general question of the ethics. Um, if I can just uh, add a, um, one point to that question about the children and you know the, the protection, for example, in uh, in because that's a general ethical question. It applies not just to open source investigations, but to journalism generally. In Aleppo, there used to be this little girl who was posting pictures and videos when it was under siege and when it was being bombed. And um, so some of us knew who she was and where she lived. We knew her mother as well at the time, and we were communicating with her because the problem was the Russian government and also the Syrian regime were trying to first say, that, well, she's not even here, that she's some kind of a psychological operation, and this is all propaganda. And we knew, but we didn't reveal it at the time because the problem was that Aleppo is not too large, you know, that besieged part. Revealing that would also mean that it, because they were actually hunting for her, they will make her a target. So we had to kind of uh, be cautious. In fact, Nick Waters of Bellingcat, only after she was, you know, the Aleppo fell and she was evacuated securely, that's when he published his findings. He ended up winning the European Press Prize for that. And by contrast, something the CNN did, which is a height of, I mean, now, now this is not, um, so what happened is that there was a, also in another besieged area of Damascus, there was a hidden library. People, what they were doing was that all the bombings, wherever they were happening, so all the books that survived, they took them to one place, underground, they had set up a library in this besieged zone in Damascus. It survived for many years until Damascus fell and the regime took control. BBC knew where the library was, and uh, some of us also knew that where the library was, but BBC made a point of not revealing because it put the people who were involved under threat. CNN turned up at the door of the person, this was a 14-year-old kid, that who was managing the library and did a big story, potentially we don't know the fate of that kid. And so that is kind of a, an example of you know, pursuing a story without any consideration for how it might impact the individuals involved. Yeah, great, these ethical dilemmas are real. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, Ben, do you want to comment on the questions, the financing of open source research, how people make a living from it, who's doing it, um, and tools that are useful for the police? Yeah, thank you. 
Sure. Uh, so on the financing question, I think it's a really good question. Um, journalism and news organisations are at a tipping point at the moment, given that the majority of traffic is designed by three entities to news websites. You have social media, which used to be a huge traffic driver to news organisations. Facebook has now cut it in Australia and many other places. You have Google, which is now uh, the biggest search engine operator. They now have AI results at the top to custom that towards your interests. And then you have traffic, essentially. Standard foot pedestrian. I am going to go and type in bbc.co.uk. But the problem is the younger generation don't do that anymore. They go to TikTok to get their news. They go to Facebook to get their news. So news websites are not getting traffic. They're not getting classifieds. They're not getting ads. And this is why we're seeing a brand new generation of independent journalists popping up with YouTube channels, with TikTok platforms. We're seeing people... I, I've had colleagues when I was working at the BBC flee the BBC and start up TikTok channels on their niche. For example, uh, news religion... They're now starting it up on TikTok and they're getting far more of a revenue than they ever did at the BBC. Um, I think that's a very interesting aspect. Uh, I, I don't know how that's going to look for the future of journalism, but that's a very dangerous point when, again, I refer back to the fact that we have so many elections this year and yet news agencies are at a dip, which is a, a, a crucial point. That also goes into the danger of these kind of OSINT Twitter accounts because they get a blue tick from X and all of the retweets and all the interactions that they get means that they get money, they get profit. That is advertising revenue. Ads are served between their tweets. So if I was to quickly get a video of an explosion that happened just like that and I was the first one to pop it up saying OSINT verified without even doing a single thing, I get money. And if I'm the first one, as, as we said on the panel, I get the most money because I'm the first one that reported it. So that, in, that drives an incentive by a social media platform that should have rules and policies and regulations. No, don't do that. But that should actually have an incentive to say, let's not drive that to just have first original content to serve ads to pay that person. That's a monetary, uh, a monetary carrot stick to be the first one to publish stuff without actually verifying it. Um, on the law enforcement one, so I hope that answered your question in, in some way, shape or form. On the law enforcement one, so I personally have volunteered and worked with law enforcement in the past. So for example, National Child Protection Task Force, I worked with Aussies, Canadians, US, uh, Brits on national child protection. That was an absolute, it didn't really work too well because police agencies already find it difficult to work to each other because this is clarified and you're not you're classified and you're not vetted to see this. Whereas me coming in as an open source person, I'm like, woohoo, I got it. I can share it with anyone I want. <laughs> um, same for intelligence organisations. They hate it because they get this. They can't share it with the government, but the open source person can share it with whoever they want. Media agencies, other governments, in, in uh, diplomatic relationships with the UN, all that kind of stuff. But I think the, the essence is and I refer to this because I really like cake uh, and, and cooking as well. So I refer to it as giving people cakes, right? I'm not just going to give you a cake like that incentive from Twitter to say, hey, trust me, here's a cool cake, pay me for it. But I'm going to give you the ingredients and I'm going to give you the recipe as well. And you can replicate that cake if you're a lawyer, if you're a, a, a judge, a prosecutor, if you're a journalist, you can replicate that and put your own stamp on it and not credit me. Happens all the time. Uh, but you can basically do that and that kind of cuts that process out so that people who are volunteering that stuff online, uh, you know, a police officer could go and say, oh, okay, I've got that cake, I've got the recipe, and I've got the ingredients. I'll replicate that in my investigation. And that's a lot of our justice and accountability work that we do with international and domestic organisations as well. Hope that helps. That's great, thank you. Um, we, are, we are running slightly over, um, but no, I would... I yeah, I haven't got anything to add, but I would say I understand all the arguments about the financial stresses on journalism, but, but major organisations are, in, are investing in OSINT. Mm -hmm. they're, they're providing training to their, to their journalists. And, you know, New York Times, all sorts of people have, have offices, have sub-departments of OSINT investigations. They're calling it OSINT. So it's, it is getting, it's getting full support from the major media providers. I mean, they haven't got any money. <laughs> Great, thank you. And I'm just going to add my two points for, for, for this. Um, for, in answer to the, uh, how the finances work of this field, what I see is a really enormously fluid, dynamic social makeup. So in some parts, it's all being institutionalised. Governments are funding it, foundations are funding it, uh, philanthropists are funding it, 
you see it in banks, you see it in commercial places, you see it in universities. So there's, there's kind of different scales of how people get involved. There's also a lot of volunteers doing it, um, doing the, the very uh, wanting to have the kind of thrill of the chase of finding things out. And that has been used by Europol, uh, interestingly. They have a trace and object campaign that circulated via Reddit. It's very, very carefully controlled so that the, the volunteers know exactly what they're doing and it's not encouraging vigilantism. Um, but I think that kind of maybe matches all, all different things. And um, so I'm aware we've run out of time. I would love to keep this going um, for longer, um, uh, but I think it is time to uh, wind it all up. So um, I want to say a massive thank you to everybody that's come today. It is really great to see you all. Um, I want to say a massive thank you to the authors uh, that, that came here, the authors that couldn't come here today, um, but that gave absolutely fantastic chapters. I want to say thank you to World Scientific Publishing for coming here and for supporting us and for producing such a great book. And, oh, thank you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, don't forget to download it. Uh, thank you for reminding me. Um, and, uh, and, and I hope you enjoy it. Um, scrap, thank you. Thank you, Frontline Club. Um, and Dan and Ola, any last thank yous? I'll let you go first. I'll have the, I'll have the last word. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, not necessarily a thank you at first, but it actually is, believe me. So to put a bit of this work into context, um, we have one chapter in the book that looks at nuclear weapons. And many of us in this room know that there's 12,000 or so nuclear weapons in the world. And the interesting thing about that is we would have no idea about this number of weapons that have an existential impact on humanity's continued existence, right? And so using that example to say that some of the work we do in OSINT is foundational to how we speak truth to power. And I think that it's extremely important that we have more people come into the field, especially within the standardized methodologies that we're trying to promote. And for that, for having you know even just the basic data to work with in nuclear diplomacy because of OSINT work, I'm incredibly grateful, and I really hope that we get more people into this community. We should perhaps do more as a double act. Um, <laughs> because what I wanted to say is what can be a takeaway, what has really changed, what might be different. Uh, and uh, older members of the audience will recall uh, the scam con around intelligence and Saddam Hussein and the invasion of Iraq. And I think with what we have today, it would not have been possible for Colin Powell to go to the Security Council with his nonsense about biological weapons trucks and other, and that our panelists and others would have ripped apart that presentation and much of the disinformation, which was pervaded not by fringe media or Fox News, but by the mainstream media. The New York Times was at the head of that misinformation campaign. And if you look at the lack of confidence of the public in uh, leaders in political systems, a large part of it, certainly in this country, the disillusionment of the English middle classes uh, with the Blair government because people believe the Prime Minister, bless them, um, over that issue, would not have been possible in the world of uh, OSINT, in the world we have today. It just wouldn't. I'm not saying there aren't scams today and there won't be scams in the future, but if there's one takeaway, and this links directly with uh, what Ola was saying, it's they wouldn't have been able to get away with that then. And I think that can help us a great deal as an example for the future. On that substantive point, I'll close. And thanks again to heroic Henrietta uh, and her brains, <laughs> in particular your brains. My multiple brains. Multiple brains, yes, for nav navigating and having the, the, the geni intellectual genius to bring this whole project together. And we hope that this volume will be you know, a, a, a source of, uh, of hope and truth, dare one say, in a, a world of a blizzard of nonsense. So 
Uh, thank you all for coming. Hope you'll use it. And don't just download it. Use the Kindle button on Amazon and then write a review because that's what we need. Thank you. Thank you.